Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for this special dialogue. And the man of the hour is Sheikh Mohammed Abdulrahman Al Thani. He is the Deputy Prime Minister of Qatar and also the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Qatar. Thank you very much for your time. And of course, I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Nicholas Pelham, Middle East correspondent at The Economist. And uh, we're going to put His Excellency through his paces for the next half an hour. Excellency, I need to start with uh, the viewpoint of where you as Qatar stand in terms of GCC relations. I've been privy to a number of discussions, as have most of the people in this room. Uh, the foreign minister of Egypt, the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, have all been asked about Qatar and GCC. Uh, the blow up of 2017. I bring it back onto the table. I'd like your voice to weigh in at this point. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me here. Um, be delighted uh, to speak today uh, to the audience. Uh, regarding your question about the situation of, of the GCC, uh, what happened in 2017 was really a disruption for, for the region. And we believe the blockade of Qatar and the sequences of, of events after that uh, has been affecting and undermining the security of, uh, of our region. And uh, it really didn't help in our collective effort as, as GCC nations. Now, in, in, in the recent uh, weeks, maybe we, we have moved from a stalemate uh, to some progress where there are some talks uh, took place between us and, and uh, specifically and Saudi. And we hope that this, these talks will lead uh, to a progress where we can see an end uh, to, for, for, the, for the crisis. What uh, we are really looking at right now is really a forward-looking vision. We are not looking at uh, behind. We have a lot of challenges that surrounding us. And uh, Qatar uh, always aim for a uh, more stable region and more stable GCC, more united GCC. Nick? <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so, Your Excellency, uh, probably should, should express our commiserations for Qatar losing to Saudi Arabia 1-0 one, one in the Arabian uh, Cup. But you had some, some uh, compensation, perhaps, that you, you, you did defeat the Emiratis. Um, what does that tell us about the state of kind of relations specifically with Saudi Arabia and the Emirates at the moment? What have you managed to, to do, really, to stitch back the um, uh, relations? And w can you tell us a little bit, bit more about your meetings in Riyadh? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, this compliment about our <laughs> national team uh, beating or winning uh, against uh, the UAE. And unfortunately, we lost yesterday uh, against Saudi, but we wish them all the best. At the end, we believe that uh, football and sports unites people. And uh, we believe such a step is, is, is a positive step, that they are participating within this championship, which uh, has been a very long-standing uh, tradition for the Gulf countries where the countries are, are coming together. Uh, you know, talking about the progress and what's happening right now, what I can tell you, given the sensitivity of, of the issue, we, we cannot uh, elaborate much about it, but uh, we are uh, at least moving uh, uh, from the status of, of stalemate and uh, the initial demands and all the discussion about the rationality in the 13s and, and the others uh, to uh, more uh, talks about uh, forward-looking thinking is not, is not uh, and those uh, I cannot disclose officials who are they or what are the countries or the parties involved, but what I can say here that there are uh, sequences of, of uh, events took place under also uh, under the Kuwaiti mediation. And His Highness the Emir of Kuwait, uh, we are very thankful uh, for him as all G GCC countries for his continuous efforts and commitment in uh, restoring the GCC. So back. just before Nick goes on there, I just, so can we confirm, as the media reports are saying, that you were in Riyadh? 
Well, I cannot, I cannot, uh, uh, I, I told you, I won't go to, uh, into the details. There are several meetings took place in different, in different countries, in different places, between officials, without disclosing the name of the officials who participated in these meetings. Fair point. Okay. So, if, if we're looking forward, let's start with, with, with Iran. Clearly, there is a kind of position that other members of the GCC have towards Iran, which mm, are not the case in Qatar. You, you have maintained your relations with, with, with Iran throughout. Are you now planning to kind of fall in line with, with the Saudis and with the Emiratis on Qatar and downgrade your relations uh, on Iran uh, and downgrade your relations with, with, with Iran, or perhaps even sever them as the Saudis have done? Well, uh, in relation to, to Iran, uh, first of all, we have to acknowledge that Iran is our neighbor. And we look at it differently than uh, maybe countries who are here in the West or the United States. We will remain having a relation of good neighborhood with them. We are sharing with them an interest, which is our gas field. We are sharing with them an interest of security of our borders and their borders as well. And uh, when uh, the blockade took place, Iran opened up for us and opened their space. And uh, the Qatari people are very thankful for uh, this move. Uh, relating this to Qatar policy, uh, would it change if, the, uh, if there is a restoration in the Gulf? We don't see any uh, correlation between the two uh, steps with uh, Qatar has been always with an independent foreign policy, and this foreign policy will remain independent. And we don't think that this, our internal or external affair, will be subject for negotiation with anyone. We understand if there are some concerns uh, of our neighbors, we are willing to discuss those concerns and to address them. But uh, we, are not, we are not going to talk about what should we do and what we shouldn't as, as a sovereign nation. And I don't think any sovereign country accept uh, this. We believe that in one day, the entire region needs to talk to Iran. We need to restore stability in, in our region. And we believe that the dialogue will be uh, the ultimate solution for what's happening. And what's, uh, the current tension is not in favor of anyone. Can, and the other issue that has, has that emerged this morning was that of political Islam, where again it's come up repeatedly that Qatar has been, you know, the crucible for 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 the Brotherhood and for other Islamist movements in in, in the region. Do you think that you did back the wrong horse? And how is that going to change? There have been reports that the Brotherhood is going to be expelled from Qatar altogether. What is your response? Well, uh, first of all, we disagree with the premise because Qatar has not been supportive for Muslim Brotherhood or political Islam, but this stereotype has been repeated now for a for long time. We need to uh, uh, look at uh, what Qatar really did with the countries, whether it's with, under political Islam leadership, Muslim Brotherhood leadership, or uh, other leaderships. We have. Uh, for example, uh, Tunisia, uh, Muslim Brotherhood were in power. Qatar supported Tunisia after the Arab Spring. Uh, Muslim Brotherhood left power. Qatar doubled their support to, uh, support to Tunisia after that. And we continue with this support because our support goes to the people, not to the political party. At the end of the day, Qatar is a state, not a political party. We will uh, remain supporting countries that uh, are important to us, the people of those countries we are going to support them. In Egypt is the same case. Our support went to, uh, to Egypt when the military council was in power. It continued after they elected their president, which was fair and, and transparent uh, 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 election. We continued our support after what happened and after the overthrow of Morsi, and we didn't stop this. So uh, tying Qatar with a single party or, or with Muslim Brotherhood or with single ideology it's, uh, uh, it's, it's proven that it's, it's, a wrong, uh, it's a wrong accusation, and we will continue uh, our po carrying our policy in support for the people, despite their leadership and whom they are uh, electing for their leadership. So, so Brian, forgive me, but just one follow-up. Yeah. It has been reported that the Muslim Brotherhood will, will no longer have a formal presence in in Doha. Is that, is that the case? Muslim Brotherhood, they don't have a formal, a formal presence in Doha, and they never had a formal, a formal presence in Doha. 
And will you be uh, pushing them, pushing them out? Uh, well, what has been reported, what I can tell you, what has been reported, that we agree on something and we disagreed on, on, on another thing. It's totally wrong. We are still in, in discussion. And as I told you, the elements of the discussion will remain discreet. I want to chat more broadly about foreign policy and your relationship with the West. And, and this may be a little cheeky, but there is a perception that uh, the wealth factor will draw you many friends from the West. Are you being courted left, right, and center, Your Excellency? Well, uh, definitely Qatar considered one of the wealthy nation. We are blessed with, uh, with natural resources, which we are using for the prosperity of the country and for our people and for the good of, the, of humanity. Uh, we, we are very proud uh, with our partnership with Europe, with uh, other countries as well. We, have, we are doing uh, an excellent investments, uh, whether it's here in Italy or across Europe or in North America, Asia, Africa. And we have seen that this investment is helping and serving our national agenda to do, diversify our economy away from the hydrocarbon. Of course, there might be, with some people, uh, some misperception that uh, it can be only Qatar as deep pocket. But once they start deal with Qatar, they know uh, how professional our people are and how sophisticated is the process for us to select our investments. And these decisions has been taken on purely commercial basis, and none of them is politically motivated. Any comment on relations potentially with France and their investments into North Africa? Uh, well, uh, we have, we have uh, a lot of investments uh, in France, and we are also in partnership with some of the French companies in, in, in different countries, uh, for example, in, in, in Africa. And we are looking forward to expand this partnership with France and with other countries as well to serve uh, and to learn from their experience in the regions where they uh, have, uh, in, whether it's in Asia, in Latin America, or in, in, uh, in Africa. China, can we bring China into the fray? And Nick, before you, yeah. you continue uh, on your vein, give me a sense of uh, how close you are with the Chinese. There, there are many reports out there that this is a relationship that you are nurturing. Well, uh, our relation with China has been, uh, has been very good and very strong in, uh, in the energy sector, especially. Uh, we are one of their uh, sources of, uh, of supplies for the LNG. We have very uh, strong trade relationship also in the other sectors. There is a lot of Chinese investment in, uh, in Doha, as well as uh, Qatari investments in, in China. And we believe that China is one of the world power where Qatar will always uh, work on building a relation and a strong partnership with them. Can we come back a little bit to the, to, um, uh, to, to the GCC and look at the decisions which were taken um, before this crisis broke over imposition of VAT? Some countries have, have imposed um, uh, VAT. Um, Qatar has, has not. As part of your realignment back into the fold, Will you now be imposing VAT in Qatar? Well, uh, the VAT is really a national-driven decision. It has been uh, taken consideration, uh, the GCC factors. Uh, but uh, we, have, uh, we have decided as a government uh, to uh, look at it uh, gradually. And we are starting with uh, some selective items. So it's, there is a selective. VAT applied on uh, materials which are affecting the health, for example. So uh, this is a step, and we are continuing our study based on our economic needs. Um, so again, looking at um, uh, so the the internal the internal economy and sort of uh, um, if you look at your your own foreign workers, when Gulf nationals come to the West, they expect to have. Certain, certain rights, they expect to have residency rights, they expect to at some point be able to apply after one generation or two or maybe less to, for citizenship. That's not a right that you accord your own foreign nationals in, in Qatar. Can you see a point where foreign nationals will be able to apply for a green card or for, 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 for citizenship? Well, uh, it depends. Each country has different laws and has uh, different constitution. Our constitution in Qatar 
and the laws in Qatar is for, uh, prohibiting uh, dual uh, citizenship for, for the Qatari people. We have our special characteristic, which we are uh, happy with, and uh, we would love to preserve. There are others who, though, I mean, if, if, if you were to have governments in the West that said under no circumstances can foreigners have equal rights to, um, to nationals, can they never apply for, can they never gain citizenship? Others would turn around and call that deeply racist. Well, we didn't call it racist. It's, it's, a, sovereign, yeah. it's a sovereign decision. Whether if the Europeans, they are basing their, uh, their uh, decisions based on their internal needs and assessment, we have to respect this, and they have to respect our decisions as well. Can I go good, cap, yes. good yeah. cop now? Or, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, just please. Earlier yeah. I was chatting to uh, the CEO of the Qatar Investment Authority, um, His Excellency Al Mahmoud, and we were chatting about LNG and the diversification within your broader economy. You talked to me about uh, the drivers of uh, the economy and this focus on LNG, liquid natural, uh, liquid natural gas. Well, uh, Qatar, Qatar is, is one of the world leaders in, in the LNG supplies, and we have seen uh, this progress, which started almost more than 20 years ago, uh, Qatar now is supplying 25% of the LNG requirement in the world. And uh, we are very proud of, of this progress and we are going to continue that. But uh, in order to have a sustainable growth and sustainable development for our country, we have to diversify away from the LNG. And we have worked uh, as part of our Qatar National Vision 2030, which was launched in 2008 uh, to diversify our economy where we were at, at a position of uh, uh, the hydrocarbon contribution to the GDP was above uh, 80%, uh, and we reached uh, last year almost at 50% of hydrocarbon and 50% from different sectors. And our ultimate objective is really to dilute the contribution of, of the hydrocarbon uh, more. And uh, even with, uh, with the expansion and, and the progress that Qatar is going to have in the next few years in, in the LNG production, this shouldn't affect our uh, growth, uh, our growth from, from uh, be driven by, by other sectors. We are focusing on our investments, on our international investments, focusing on attracting foreign investments in Qatar, focusing on uh, developing and, and encouraging the private sector to nurture uh, in Qatar and providing them with the, with the right environment. There are a lot of government initiatives which uh, took place in, in the past few years and uh, the whole government is, is focused to drive the economy away from the hydrocarbon, which will remain a very important factor in our growth. Nick, you want to go to, to Al Jazeera? Um, I yeah, I mean, it's, I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, um, watch it. it it's, a remarkable, it's, it's a remarkable channel. It's, um, it's very good at exposing um, dissent across, uh, across uh, the Middle East. It's much less good at um, exposing mm, views, dissent uh, in, in, in Qatar. And I just want to, you know, given, given, given the focus that you, know, you provide a platform for um, exposing problems in other countries, but when it comes to how you manage Qatar itself, you know, academic freedoms are a question. Um, uh, opinions can be um, dissent is not is not encouraged. Um, at what point do you think Al Jazeera and sort of Qatar generally can provide a greater kind of spotlight on um, in internal uh, dissent? And at what point are you going to start moving towards the electoral you know, program that, that, that you welcome in other countries? Well, first of all, uh, Qatar has uh, now took uh, a long way in, in progressing ad and advancing freedom of academia and the freedom of expression. And I don't think that you can see uh, other examples in the region, in, in the Gulf region, reaching to uh, the same level of, of freedom we know. This is a long journey, which took a lot of uh, developed nations uh, years and decades to, uh, to achieve uh, their ultimate objective. And in Qatar, we are uh, the same of, of those countries. 
Uh, speaking about Al Jazeera and your point about uh, Al Jazeera exposing everything in the Middle East and except Qatar, Qatar has never been uh, like uh, uh, things are major things happening which is concerning to the region and concerning to the surrounding as and never been reported in, in Al Jazeera and any report if you see it in international media outlet which worth uh, being broadcasted in, on Al Jazeera, we have seen them there. I don't see the point where uh, Al Jazeera is not uh, exposing what's going on in Qatar. For example, when we had an issue with the labors, it has been uh, already uh, in a place in, in Al Jazeera. It's been aired on, Al -Jazeera, uh, on all uh, their outlets. And uh, we have always, we have a discussion there is always a Qatari officials uh, can speak to Al Jazeera to present the point of view of Qatar. Uh, if there are any controversial steps that I take as a foreign minister of Qatar, it has been reported over there in Al Jazeera. We know what uh, our, our aim when we established Al Jazeera is to establish a pan-Arab news network that can report uh, the truth and what's happening in the region. And we will be in the first row. In, in reporting this truth about ourselves. And trust me, we have enough courage to put ourselves forward, and we never closed our door to criticism. And this is not applied only to uh, Al Jazeera, it's to anyone. I mean, we have standing invitation for all the rapporteurs of the United Nations. They can come in Doha, they can see what's going on there, they can criticize us from Doha. So, uh, civil society organizations, they come here, they launch their reports from Doha with press conferences, and no one has, has uh, uh, stopped them from doing so. And this has been acknowledged uh, by, by all these organizations. So uh, I think that uh, putting Qatar in, in the same corner as the others where we are uh, trying to shut uh, anything against us is an unfair statement for, for Qatar. Uh, what has been achieved uh, in Qatar, I think it's, it's a precedent and a role model in our region, and it needs uh, more encouragement and support to uh, progress more. Your Excellency, you're seeing protests uh, across the region, and I suppose we want to get a sense of how resilient the GCC environment is from those uh, widespread protests. Well, uh, I think watching what's happening now in, in the region, it's, uh, it's really a continuation of a process which started in, in 2011 when the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring. took place. What uh, we are seeing right now happening uh, and the people uh, protesting, uh, I'm sure they have uh, a legitimate demands that needed to be addressed and Qatar will remain supportive for, for uh, the will of the people and will continue also offer its advice, uh, the right advice for the governments in order to make sure that anything happen uh, to address these needs to happen in a way ensuring the stability of, of the countries and not using any uh, means or, or methods that lead to uh, a chaos which we don't want to see and we never wanted to see even uh, during uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, how resilient is the GCC? We believe the GCC has uh, its own nature, which is different than the other countries uh, where uh, the protests are, are happening. Uh, it's the economic situation over there for the people. It's vary from a country to another, but uh, also the relationship between the leadership and the people, the way it's, uh, it's handled, at least in, in Qatar, what I can see and what I'm allowed to speak about, is something uh, very unique. Uh, I mean, people has access to the leader. There is uh, a demonstration of uh, the willingness of the leadership to change and to lead change for uh, for the for the interest of of the of, of our people so uh, from uh, my point of view uh, in qatar i see it uh, something far from happening god forbid and uh, i think that also other gcc countries they have their own means to 
uh, to continue uh, addressing the demands and, and, and the desires of, of their people. There is one part of your question, sorry, I, I, I missed it, uh, about the election. It just uh, came to me. It, uh, His Highness has announced that uh, last year that uh, the next uh, council uh, will be the elected council. And uh, this year, in the opening of, of Shura Council, he announced the establishment of the, of the preparation committee, which has uh, now started the work to review all the required legislation for the election. And hopefully, uh, in the next couple of years, the election will take place as soon as the, all uh, the legal work is done. So can you, can you paint a picture of, I mean, what does Qatar look like in five years' time? Ten years' time, are we going to see a sort of constitutional monarchy? Are we going to see um, what does it look like in terms of its foreign policy? And it, it was, if you look back to 2011, when it was, it was, it was very gung ho. It was supporting Thawa, the rebels in Libya. It was supporting rebels in in in, in Syria. Um, it, it had a, it had a very proactive foreign policy. How 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 does Qatar look in in a decade's time? Well. Uh, what we are aiming for to see uh, people participation in the decision making, which is going to happen uh, through the Shura Council. Our foreign policy is really based on principles that uh, written in our constitution and principles which Qatar has stick to for decades. It's not something new. We will continue supporting the will of the people. We are going to, to continue support our uh, the people in, in our region and uh, the governments uh, which are uh, answering to, to these demands of, of the people. And uh, we are extending our, uh, our aid and development aid and, uh, and participation with, with those countries in those countries' development to more than 100 countries. And it's really not identified by race or by ethnicity or uh, by religion. It's identified by the humanity. Wherever we see a need and we can go there and help and fulfill, uh, we will never hesitate. In terms of, of economy, uh, we hope to see continued prosperity in, in our country, uh, less uh, depending on, on hydrocarbon, uh, more uh, open uh, investment environment to attract the foreign investments. Your Excellency, uh, just because we are running out of time, and to your conclusion there, I want to bring in, uh, we spent an hour and a half talking about the intra-regional trade, uh, sitting at around 5 to 10 percent, somewhere there for the MENA region. And as we're coming to this final play, do you think we're going to see 10 years out that this inter-regional trade across the MENA is uh, firing on all cylinders, so to speak? Well, uh, uh, we, hope, we hope that uh, in order to have the inter-regional trade, prosperity, everything, you need to have the shared security first. Otherwise, you cannot reach to such a level. And Qatar uh, hope to see a regional security framework to come in place and bring all the players together in order to agree on a shared security principle to move to the next step of, of prosperity and interregional trade and develop the different areas of cooperation. Other than that, without f shared security, I don't see any progress in any other front. Your Excellency, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, could we have a round of applause for the Deputy Prime Minister of Qatar and Minister of Foreign Policy. Thank, thank you very much. And Nick, yeah, thank, thank you very much thank for sh okay, sharing you. the stage. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.